we got ammo resupplied twice for the whole entire trip. Like we brought lots of stuff. We ran out really fast. Now to an ABC News exclusive here. Some dramatic moments on the battlefield. American troops suddenly ambushed by the Taliban. When the firefight started, the troops were operating in a region known as the Valley of Death. Welcome to Heroes Behind Headlines. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Please subscribe and check out some of our past episodes, such as Inside the Real Takedown of El Chapo and Hunting Al-Qaeda's Biggest Financier, as well as new episodes that are released every week. Our guest today is mixed martial artist, television host, entrepreneur, author of the excellent new book, Scars and Stripes, and Green Beret and Sniper, Tim Kennedy. He's going to talk about a particularly harrowing mission he went on while serving in Afghanistan in January 2008, one in which he was sure he was going to die. It took place in what was known to coalition forces as the Valley of Death. The mission involved resupplying forward operating base Anaconda in the heart of Oruzgan province, the most Taliban-centric area of Afghanistan. We're honored to feature the amazing Tim Kennedy as today's hero behind the headlines. I was born in San Luis Obispo, California, a police officer for a father, you know, amazing mother that was really supportive. Um, yeah, it sounds like you had like a unique combination of parents there. I did a really great balance, you know, a mom that played the piano and, you know, a dad that wear the blue suit, the power tie and, you know, steal a Lamborghini or a Porsche for a drug from a drug dealer. Um, <laughs> it was awesome. You know, we'd go to classical music in San Francisco and ballets and operas, you know, but then my dad would ask me to go and steal a, uh, a registration out of a drug dealer's car in the parking lot. Wow. It was awesome. Okay. So you go to high school, you go to public school, right? No, I was homeschooled. Oh. Yeah. Oh, homeschooled. I, I got, yeah. I got pulled out my, in, out of kindergarten after getting in trouble a bunch of times, you know, I they can't believe you got in trouble. Don't tell me. Oh, yeah. I know <laughs> they, um, they, you know, like kindly asked me not to come back to school ever. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you took that kind of energy and you put it into, uh, you tried a couple things before you landed on the military, right? Yeah. I, I, uh, idle hands, you know, are devil's tools. Um, we, if I have free time, I destroy things, uh, to, to include my life. So anytime that I'm not very busy, I am destructive. So it was, especially as a child, I know that feeling. Yeah. I think, I think everybody does. Right. You know, right. One of the many things about that book is everybody's like, dude, I remember feeling like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, so firefighter, EMT, police officer, and then ultimately watching a bunch of people jump to their deaths so they didn't burn alive got me really angry, and that was the beginning of me trying to work myself into special forces. By the end of 2007, Tim had already completed important and challenging missions in both Iraq and Afghanistan, but none of them compared to the crucible of terror he was about to face. At the time, Tim was tasked with what he describes as the coolest, most international mission imaginable, supplementing British, Czech, French, or Italian Tier 1 units, a.k.a. the toughest guys on the planet. In January 2008, he was assigned to liaison with the Czech Special Forces Company, men Tim humorously described as genetically engineered to be twice the size of normal men. Together with U.S. Special Forces ODA 7182 and a squad of Afghan troops, their mission was to escort a convoy of 80 Afghan jingle trucks filled with enough food, ammunition, and medicine to supply forward operating base Anaconda for an entire year. Lying in wait in the mountains around them were hardened companies of Taliban fighters supplemented by Iranian freedom fighters. 
Because of the precarious location of the base in a valley surrounded by towns friendly to the Taliban, air resupply wasn't an option. We had a large convoy, a resupply that was going to go into Firebase Anaconda, which is like in the Urzgan province. And um, it strategically is the worst situated base in maybe all of Afghanistan. Yeah, it sounds horrible. Yeah, it's terrible. It has almost been run over, I think, two or three times by the Taliban. You know, it, it is it is rough, but it's close to the city, close to the village. And, you know, Special Forces works with the people. And uh, so uh, giving up a strategic position so that we have the opportunity to be co-located with the people was what was the reason that the base was situated where it was. Because of the way that it was situated, it was very hard for it to be resupplied. Um, if they tried to do air bundles, oftentimes, um, you know, wind would, would, would mess it up and they'd be dropped out and the Taliban would get their hands on it. Um, they didn't have an airstrip to land. You know, it's hard getting an, a base resupplied with food and water for, you know, for about two companies of people uh, via Blackhawk or Chinook. So we had a bunch of jingle trucks, which are like, think like a half semi truck that has like goats hanging off the, <laughs> off the roof, yeah. you know, and, and pieces of cloth that cover every inch of it. Yeah. Ugh. And you had like 80, I think you started out with, right? Yeah, at least. And we had to, we had to drive from one of the big AOBs to Firebase Anaconda. And we planned on losing vehicles, you know, from overheating or fuel or you know poor maintenance by the driver so we, we definitely you know built in a 200 percent plan for lost material but uh like we definitely did not plan for the type of fight that we got in or the type of losses that we that we had to endure right and you were with afghans czechs and a special forces group correct that's right yeah so we had a special oda that was in charge of the overall movement. And then we had the, the SOTIF kind of ground force commander that was in charge of the movement of the jingle trucks. And then we had the Czech special operations unit that was being moved into Firebase Anaconda. Uh huh. Oh, they were going to be stationed there. That's right. Oh, wow. So that's wow. the reason I was there, was because I was supporting the Czech special operations unit into their firebase. I was an observer and a sniper for the Czechs as part of the USASOC. Um, you know, they, they had this coalition program where they would take a special operations guy and co-locate them with the foreign special operations allies so that when that group was trying to talk to the military, there was somebody that could do it in the language of the respective military. And how are you communicating with these guys? You don't speak Czech. I don't, but almost all of them speak English. Oh, okay. All right. So let's start the journey. So you got these 80 jingle trucks. You were in the, the second truck in That's the right. lead, right? Armored vehicle. There's Afghans in front of you. And you're talking about, what was it, a three-day drive to this base? No, it was a, it was like a week drive. Oh, okay. Um, but the from the moment that we got ambushed until we finally made it into the base, uh, it was an additional three days from kind of when the tick, when uh, we got in contact, when we started getting shot and blown up. From that moment on, it was an additional three days. Oh, okay, got it. So you set out, and uh, it's this really narrow dirt road. It sounds like it goes up this mountain, and then it goes down the mountain on the other side. Is That's that correct? Right. Yeah. Yep. And then what happens? So – you know, we start driving through these villages and uh, it was like I was out of a Western movie. You know, you're waiting for like the tumbleweed to cross the road. It's like, you know, there's nothing there. And so the towns so, are, they're deserted. Yeah, that's right. Totally empty. Eerie feeling. Yeah, it's a weird, yeah, you definitely know you're about to get into it when that starts happening. And uh, when we made it to like kind of through the mountains and we're in the, this really, really narrow pass, the road is barely wide enough for, you know, two vehicles to pass through there. And there's just one road and it's a steep, um, you know, it goes down towards this little creek and this little green small trees that kind of grow by the, tr by the water in Afghanistan. 
And uh, this ultimately would be the initiation point and the kill zone for the Taliban's ambush, uh, was which is at the bottom the bottleneck of this ravine. Yeah, there's a really interesting thing in the book, and that is that these Taliban units were working with Iranians, which you don't hear that in the news, right? Yeah, they don't. I don't <laughs> know. That's not frequently covered. Yeah, That's but wild. most. Most of the Taliban's equipment were coming from Iran. Wow. And this isn't near the Iranian border either. No. So what's the first contact like? It's deafening. The first day out, Tim was riding shotgun in the second vehicle in the convoy with three SF soldiers named Mike. Irish Mike was driving the Humvee. Mike Keller manned the 50 cal turret and Mike G kept guard in back. Leading the convoy in another Humvee was the Afghan military squad. As they approached the first village, they were shocked to find it completely abandoned. Then they started intercepting cell phone calls made by the Afghan jingle truck drivers who were not supposed to be carrying phones. It took no stretch of the imagination to conclude that they were communicating with the Taliban. Tensions rose precipitously. Then Tim got word that the convoy had to stop because some of the jingle trucks had overheated. How was that possible? They had only been driving for a little over an hour. Upon investigation, someone had punched holes in the vehicle's radiators with a screwdriver. With no time to make repairs, they transferred supplies to the healthy trucks. Then the giant record truck they had with them literally picked up the broken down trucks and threw them down the side of the mountain. All of this gave the Taliban time to set up the ambush that they all knew was coming. You know, the, the IED goes off. I'm not sure if it was a pressure plate or if it was like a direct command initiation. Um, but ID goes off. The vehicle in front of me just gets, you know, half vaporized. It flips up in the air and it lands on the hood of our of our Humvee, oh, God. and um, and that's kind of the beginning. That's the initiation of the ambush. You know, machine gun fires going off, RPGs are skipping off hoods, and that's that's the start of it all. So we we think they're dead, and our vehicle backs out and kind of backs up this hill, and um, the vehicle tumbles off the front of our hood and kind of like goes down the hill a little bit towards that water. And uh, once we get up on there, Mike, who is up in the machine gun position on a 50 cal, he's just like, like he's just hammering away. I crack my door open. I pull my sniper rifle out. I'm taking shots anywhere that I see muzzle flashes, you know, but like my ears are ringing. You know, like I just got my head rocked and, um, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on. And Mike Irish, who's driving the vehicle, you know, he starts screaming that all the dudes down in the other vehicle are still alive because he sees them moving and screaming. So he hops out to run down to go and rescue them. And I was like, Mike, don't like this is really, really dumb. We're going to die. But I wouldn't let him go by himself. So I took off and ran with him. Wow. And you get to the vehicle. Uh, uh, miraculously, you don't get hit. Right. Because there's there must be bullets like splashing all over the place. Right? Yeah. We literally run down back down into the kill zone which is like the dumbest thing that you could do. And um, when I get down there, I don't know how we, we, we made the run down there. Um, when we get back down to the kill zone, I have my sniper rifle. It's suppressed, you know, an SR-25. And I'm pulling this dude out from underneath his turret. And, uh, you know, he's screaming. Most of his lower half is gone. Oh and um, Mike is grabbing this other guy. And as we were both dragging these guys out, a bunch of Taliban – go to assault through the the kill zone like this is seven dash eight infantry 101 ambush surprise initiation um significant fire and then you assault across the ambush line and i have a half a body here and then i have my sniper rifle in my other hand i'm trying to like pivot to like shoot over there mike k who's up in the turret he swings his 50 cal over and I, you know, it's, it's really hard to put into words what it means to have like there's a person there in front of you that's running at you with an AK and then they don't exist. You know, 
it's not like in the movies where you know like there's blood splatter and the guy like flies back i'm talking like they just no longer were there at this point in the ambush tim realized he was going to die he was sure he'd never see his wife and kids again and didn't want that to happen the action played out in front of them with constant incoming ak and rpg rounds glancing off the armored humvee Tim and the two Mikes fired back like madmen. When things got particularly intense, Irish Mike slammed the vehicle in reverse, and the Afghan Humvee that had landed on their roof slid off. Through the dust and chaos, Irish Mike saw that the Afghans inside were still alive. How is that even possible, Tim thought. Next thing he knew, Irish Mike took off in a sprint to the totaled Afghan Humvee. Tim picked up his sniper rifle and went after him. He remembered thinking, I don't want to do this. Bullets were flying all over the place, but miraculously they weren't hit. The first guy Tim spotted in the shattered vehicle was an Afghan soldier who had lost both of his legs at the quads. Tim pulled him into a sandbag carrier, and with bile, blood, and guts spilling down his uniform, he started back. I don't know how Mike didn't kill us. Yeah, and this is flying over your heads. It's flying between us. It's going over our heads. He's shooting down and around us. Dude, the wow. dude's like a magician. Yeah, yeah. Thank God for that, right? Yeah. Wow. So you're running back. You bring these guys back, and now this starts this pretty major battle, right? This is just the beginning. Yeah, and this is the beginning of a of a three day. I think they they estimate there's four to six hundred foreign fighters that were fighting in that valley. You know, we had Apaches, we had F-16s, F-18s, you know, we had A-10s, we had a C-130 that was just hammering these guys. You know, every single one of our guns, we got ammo resupplied twice. You know, like we burnt through all the ammo and we, we moved out with the intent to be in a fight for the whole entire trip. So it's not like we packed light. Like we, we brought lots of grenades and we brought right. lots of, of linked machine gun we brought lots of um grenades for our automatic grenade launchers like we brought lots of stuff we ran out really fast wow and meanwhile you're dealing with this convoy of trucks behind you right and uh you're losing trucks all the time right because guys are they're running off and the other problem you have is that these drivers i mean you don't know who these guys are right and they've got cell phones and obviously they're communicating with the taliban yeah, yeah. I mean, they're giving them kind of play by place to our location. You know, this this uh, ambush was obviously orchestrated in collaboration with somebody that was moving with us. Right. And you've got this big tow truck kind of vehicle with you. Oh, you have the other thing of like unloading the supplies from from the trucks, right? Yeah, the the trucks were loaded about 60, 70 percent, one to keep them light so we could drive on these roads. But two, if we lost a truck, we'd be able to cross load them. And uh, so we were, what you know, once we crossloaded, like that was by hand, us moving pallets and pallets of water and food. Um, and then the wrecker would come in and, uh, you know, like, think like this crane that would just be able to like, knock these trucks off the side of the hill. It was <laughs> wild just to see the truck just tumble yeah. down this hill wow. that was just so we could keep driving. Yeah. Crazy. So you're losing trucks all the time. All the time. Everywhere. Yeah. Now, it's like a, a whole day, right, before you start moving again. Is that correct? Or is it longer than that? So it's early afternoon when we were ambushed. We fought through the afternoon into darkness, and then we kind of set up this secure security perimeter at this high ground because our trucks can't drive at night. Our truck drivers don't have night vision. So they can either turn on their lights and just get lit up, or we can stay in place. And that was a really tough decision for the commander to make was do we push on with white light and just get, you know, like, cause you can sit a couple hundred meters back in the darkness and just like blink, 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 just murdering these drivers. Right. So we thought that we would have fewer casualties if we just stayed in the darkness. And uh, so then all the SF guys with our thermals and our night vision, um, you know, a lot of the Taliban, a lot of the foreign fighters don't have that equipment. So we kind of had an advantage of that night. So that first night, it went from them having the initiative, them having the surprise, to them just crying, crawling behind rocks and not making themselves 
ever out in the open. Otherwise, they'd be dead. As the sun went down, the situation got even worse. Since the jingle trucks weren't equipped with night vision, and the road ahead skirted a dangerous ravine along a mountain, they had to stop, which rendered them sitting ducks. Even worse, they were running out of ammunition. A helpless fear took over, which quickly turned to quiet panic. Then the least imposing guy in the entire convoy, a tiny pasty-faced Air Force attack controller, who they referred to as Gizmo, stepped forward to save their asses. Manning three different radios and talking fast like he was on crack, he spewed out numbers, equations, and angles so that air support overhead could pound the shit out of enemy positions. Particularly effective was the spooky AC-130 gunship, a floating monster equipped with 25mm cannon, 40mm cannon, and a 105mm howitzer. In the morning, as the sun started to peek over the horizon, Tim saw the mountains strewn with enemy dead and wounded, like a scene out of the movie Braveheart. It was now his job to check heat signatures and use his sniper rifle to finish off those who were still alive, a process that took two grueling hours. Each shot, he said, carved another little piece out of his soul. Oh, it was horrible. Dude, I cried, cried reading the audiobook, um, reliving that. So, you know, like the Spartans, you have the plungers, you have the, the, the phalanx, like the front line, and then behind that, you have the spear guys, the swords. And uh, as they move forward, you have these guys with plungers. They're just like these, these spears with a straight head that they just stab these dudes as they stepped over their bodies. You know, and I had to be the plunger where in the morning, you know, if a body had a heat signature um, and a weapon, we'd drop around in them. You know, we couldn't have these guys getting up and, fa- and being behind us and on our back. And like, it was the most heartless, soulless, like people think war movie action, you know, like this, this is work. Like this is horrible, soul stealing work. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you start moving again, right? Yeah. And how does that go? So we, we fight for about a day more to get um, to the outskirts of the city. Um, we fight through a couple more villages. And um, and the whole entire time, we are in contact. Um, you know, we're getting shot. You know, RPGs are still coming. You know, but we have constant air cover and air support. Yeah, without air support, you guys would have been finished, right? No doubt. We, we would have been dead in an hour. Yeah, and your Air Force guy is like a, a, a hero. What, Gizmo? Or Yeah, we call, I call him Gizmo in the book just because okay. he's, still, he's still working operationally. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, so anytime like, I use like a pseudonym, um, it's it's because like those people are still doing rad work. Got it, got it, got it. But he's brilliant, man. He sounds like he's, he's yeah, there was working a moment, free radios. Yeah, in the middle of the night, you know, he, he's talking to one aircraft that's that's – doing an orbit he's doing he's talking to another fast mover that's coming in to do gun runs you know he's got a helicopter and an a-10 that's staged to come in um you know he's changing armament on different aircraft and it sounds like he's speaking in tongues right because you know, he, he's, he's speaking in plain text you know but he you know he's dropping coordinates he's lazing targets you know and he's 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 you know if you've ever thought like what it sounds like in an air traffic control tower that's what it sounded like from this guy who's moving multiple aircraft all the while he's dropping bombs and doing gun runs. Wow. wow. Amazing. It's yeah. Brilliant. All right. So now you're headed towards this village. You know, tell us about that. Yeah, so, th- so there's a village between us and Firebase Anaconda. We have to go through the village to get to Firebase Anaconda. And clearly the Taliban and all the foreign fighters have already infiltrated the village and they have set up inside of that village. So – We have to do, we have to clear this whole entire city building by building. Before the trucks can come through. That's right. And, you know, this goes from like open warfare to close quarter battle with civilians. Sucks. So you're going door to door. You don't have time to be polite. 
we uh, we're getting shot at from a, a particular compound, and we 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 move over and maneuver to that building, and um, the AMRAP, it, which is like this big, huge, gigantic bomb-proof truck, is ramming the back side of it. When me and my buddy Mike go around the front, when we go through the front. Um, I'm about to push a door open, and Mike shoves me, and I fall back as machine gun rounds just start zipping through this door. Like, I don't know. To this day, um, Mike's not with us anymore. He actually went back to Afghanistan multiple times in his last tour there in 2019 on December 20th. Uh, Mike was killed. Oh, that's, um, that's terrible. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, in this moment, Mike saves my life. And I don't know if he heard something. I don't know if, like, God and a guardian angel went into his hands. I don't know what happened. But he just pushes you back. Yep, and the door just starts disintegrating. As they entered a valley and approached the next village, their convoy was greeted with mortar fire. Gizmo called in AC-130s and Apache helicopters. The Taliban's main position in the town was a modern school built by the United States. Tim wanted it leveled, but the SF leader overruled him. Tim and the Czechs fought forward to link up with a Special Forces Voltron unit, which was arriving from Anaconda. Seeing them ahead, Tim sprinted the last hundred feet to the lead Humvee and armed himself with two AT-4 rocket launchers and a Carl Gustav recoilless rifle. His goal was to take out a Taliban PKM machine gun nest in a cave above. It took three shots, but he succeeded. As they entered the town itself, Tim and the Czechs and the SF teams were faced with a different, potentially more lethal kind of combat. Door to door, close quarter battle in a town filled with civilians. Tim described it as dark, scorched earth shit. At a pivotal point in the battle, a Taliban PKM machine gun was hammering them from a small window 25 yards away. Tim sucked at throwing, but grabbed some grenades anyway and launched a perfect laser that flew in the window and took out the machine gun. It was his Aaron Rodgers moment. The best throw he's ever made. And, um, you know, when there's a lull in the fire, I see the PKM machine gun sticking through the window inside of the courtyard inside of this complex. I've never played a ball, ball sport in my life. I'm not especially talented at throwing a baseball or a football. When I saw that machine gun, I grab a grenade and I throw just a beeline through that window. You know, the grenade goes off, you know, and what you want to hear after a grenade goes off is silence. And uh, what had happened was that that foreign fighter had bunkered himself in that room with a bunch of women and children. What evil, right? What like what kind of evil does that? Pure, pure evil. So, uh, so you're hearing all these screams now. Yep. So we clear for the rest of the building. The, the bad guys have squirted out of that building. They're moving away. I scream for one of our 18 deltas, this gigantic medic. He comes and starts saving them, and he tells me to go back to the truck. I go back to the truck, hop in the gun in the turret, and I see the dudes that are running from this building. You know, and I'm just like. You want those guys. <laughs> I want them. Yeah. So they yeah. die. Yeah. So then we fight our, all, our way all the way to the fire base and, uh, you know, alive miraculously. And then you just collapse, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, in, in my, in my uniform that's covered with other men's bile and crap and vomit. And, um, I think some of my crap, uh, you know, I just fall over like a dead man. Wow. And sleep for like 12 hours, I think you say in the book. Yeah. And then you got to go back, right? Yeah, so we, we actually take a different route out. Uh, and So you supply, I think you said out of 80 trucks, 20 made it, right? So you, that's right. they yep. unload the trucks and, and then you start back. Yep. And when we go back, there's two routes out of the town. The Czech Special Forces would do version. They go through the same road that we went out. They start getting lit up. Like, they start taking contact. And uh, so we're like, all right, you know, the plan worked. Um, 
will push out this way, and then the other ODA is going to come out and circle around and flank the the people attacking the Czech special operations guys. So we thought we were, you know, we were hoping that we were going to meet some less resistance. Not the case. <laughs> Not the case at all. Yeah. So you fight your way back, but on the way back, you go through this village that's yeah. like uh, something out of uh, like a Disney Not movie book. or something, right? It's like a little village that was nestled in this ravine in the middle of these mountains. And uh, there's a dead body hanging from a tree as we were, as we were rolling in. And I was like, it was so, it was so morbid, right? Something it was like so out of apocalypse now or something. Yeah. What it what actually was, was a symbol to the Taliban that anybody coming to this village that wants to do Taliban things is going to die. Like that is the fate that you're going to, that you're going to get if you do this. We make our way into this village, and I just see the most beautiful people. They're beautiful. They're stunning. I could see a little Genghis Khan in there. I could see some Russians in there. You know, um, I could see like all of the invasions and all of the colonizers that have tried to colonize Afghanistan, and they were just like the most beautiful, peaceful people. And this old man comes up. You know, his his face looked like it was ancient, and um, you know, and he 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 hugs me, which is not yeah. Not what Not you expect. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't believe it. My soul. But most of all, like my body couldn't believe it. You know, it, was, it just couldn't figure out what was going on. And they just, they, they were all like that, right? They were like yeah. uh, welcoming you, happy people. Uh, Nuts and like, they had figs and they were trying to feed us. You know, they were like, I could see the girls' faces, which is another thing that you don't see. Um, yeah, it was just like right out of a movie. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, after that, it, it sounded like it was pretty clear sailing, right? Yeah, everything filled out after that. You know, it was, then it was just, it was uh, really just driving and, and trying to get people's crap off of me. Tim was one of the last soldiers to enter the relative safety of forward operating base Anaconda. It had taken them four days to get there. Part of him couldn't believe he was still alive. Nor could he mentally reconcile what had just happened. Sure, he had killed people before in Iraq, but this was a whole different experience. In the last four days, he had pulled the trigger so many times he'd lost count. And some of the Taliban had shielded themselves with children the same age as his own daughters. What Tim had experienced was modern warfare at its most intense and savage. From the coalition command's point of view, the mission was a success, despite the fact that they had set out with 80 jingle trucks filled with supplies and had arrived with only 20. For Tim, the sacrifice was too big to measure. In his excellent new book, Scars and Stripes, he writes, and I quote, I know in movies they make it seem like we turn off our brains, like we're some kind of killing machines that do not feel. But the opposite is true. The pain and guilt is absolutely unbearable. We thank Tim for his unflinching bravery, honesty, and service to our country. He's the epitome of the modern warrior, dedicated to helping people and defending and upholding our highest human values. Tim Kennedy is today's hero behind the headlines. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Please subscribe and review, and join us next week for a new episode of Heroes Behind Headlines. Headlines.